Hey everyone, in this video we're going to talk about derivatives as rates of change and really how to interpret that quantity that is our derivative. We still have our interpretation that the derivative is the slope of the tangent line, but we're focusing more on that interpretation of the instantaneous rate of change of our function in this video. We can always express f prime of x using that Leibniz notation instead. Instead of writing f prime of x, we'll write it as df dx. And I like to use this Leibniz notation because it really reminds me that this derivative is a rate of change and it helps us find the units of that rate of change as well. So like I already mentioned, in this video we're going to focus on interpreting the derivative as that rate of change of our function f. So the derivative is our uh, rate of change of f, or more precisely the instantaneous rate of change of our function f. And we've already seen uh, how to interpret this. Uh, in some contexts or situations, in particular in physics, when we are tracking the motion of a moving object, we talked about how the derivative is related to uh, the velocity or the speed of the falling object. But by the end of this video, we want to be able to interpret the derivative no matter what our quantity f, our function, is describing. So our derivative is always telling us that instantaneous rate of change of our function. But when we're uh, providing an interpretation, we want to give uh, more context than that. We don't just want to say, well, it's the instantaneous rate of whatever our function is. So how do we actually write a uh, sentence or a paragraph providing that interpretation? Well, I want to give us a little like a, a Mad Lib or fill in the blanks. Once we fill in those blanks, we should only have to tweak it, tweak it slightly to uh, get the uh, correct interpretation of the derivative, no matter what our function f is describing. All right, so this little Mad Lib I have written down here in the bottom right is going to give us a kind of structure for building a paragraph or a short sentence to uh, describe or interpret that instantaneous rate of change of our function. The pieces in a blue and pink are the pieces we're going to swap out uh, once we know the context or the uh, function itself. But in general, we can always kind of interpret the derivative as, uh, or the derivative at x as after x, and x is usually representing something like units of time. So maybe after x units of time, the rate at which our function changes is predicted to be the value of our derivative, which is given by f prime of x. And the last little bit is just describing the, the units of that rate, the units of our derivative. We can always find the units of our derivative. They're the units of f per the units of x. And this goes back to using that Leibniz notation. This is why I really prefer that Leibniz notation in the setting, because the units of f we can think of as coming from the df in our Leibniz notation for the derivative. And the units of x are going to be in the denominator corresponding to that dx in our Leibniz notation. So this uh, kind of this general statement can be hard to interpret or use. So let's go ahead and look at a specific example of a function and kind of plug it all in and see how we go from the general statement to a specific interpretation. All right. So in this example, we're uh, given this function p of t, and we're asked to uh, interpret. Uh, the value of our function at 4 and at the value of the derivative of our function at 4 as well. So what is our function describing? Well, our function is describing the percent of the population infected by the, the Budweiser virus. Uh, t is representing the number of weeks since our initial infection. And we're just trying to figure out if we plug 4 into our function or into the derivative of our function, what is that actually telling us? All right, and this, uh, this data is all made up. That's why I'm calling it the Budweiser virus, not to confuse it with the coronavirus. So uh, do not use this uh, to make any predictions about the coronavirus. All right, so let's maybe start by interpreting p of 4, because that doesn't actually require the derivative at all. So if we just plug 4 into our function, uh, we can get the value of p of 4. That's not the interpretation, just the value. But if we evaluate our function at 4, it looks like we end up with about 85.8%. So I'm not going to write a sentence for this part because our focus really here is learning how to interpret the derivative, not the actual function. But our function is telling us the percent of the population infected by the Budweiser virus. And if uh, p of 4 is equal to 85.8%, our interpretation of that is, well, four weeks after the initial infection, uh, about 85.8% of the population will be infected by the virus. And so if we take a look at the, the graph of our function uh, p of t in the upper right over here, we can find the point that corresponds to p of 4 equaling 85.8%. And from this graph, we can also see 
uh, just the overall behavior of this function, at least when we set our scale up correctly, which can be a bit tricky to do. Right, we can kind of see this function uh, grows exponentially at first, but as time goes on, it plateaus. This is an example of what is called a logistic growth function. Um, it's used quite often to model things like uh, population growths or uh, infection rates, things that uh, increase exponentially but can't increase uh, indefinitely, right? There's usually some uh, cap to stop them from just going off to infinity. What is the derivative at four telling us? Well, we can kind of go back to that uh, tangent line interpretation, but I don't think that's going to be giving us what we want here. We really got to kind of use this Mad Lib and fill in our blanks. A couple things to notice is we're not using f and x in this example. Our function is called p, and the input or independent variable is t instead. So basically, each of these x's are going to turn into t's, and each of the f's are going to turn into p's. In order to find p prime of 4, we need the derivative of our function. And we can differentiate this function using some of our shortcuts. We're going to have to use our quotient rule. So remember, the quotient rule requires you to think of your function as the quotient of two different functions, uh, u and v. And it says the derivative of such a quotient, the derivative of u over v, is equal to the derivative of u times v minus u times the derivative of v all over v squared. Well, we already have our selection for u and v. u is our numerator, 100 times e to the t. v is our denominator, e to the t plus 9. So the two pieces we're really missing for our quotient rule are u prime and v prime. But because of the functions involved, these are actually pretty quick to find. Right, The derivative of u is just the derivative of 100 e to the t. The derivative of the constant multiple of the natural exponential function is equal to itself, so that doesn't actually change. If we take the derivative of the denominator, just the derivative of that constant 9 disappears, and the derivative of e to the t is still e to the t. So now we're going to have to get rid of our graph here for just a second in order to finish writing our derivative down, but we have all the pieces we need, so now let's plug them into our formula. All right, so we've got to look at u prime times v. Well, u prime is 100 times e to the t. We have to multiply that by v, our original denominator, e to the t plus 9. We have to subtract away from that the product of u and v prime. u is 100 e to the t. And v prime is, well, e to the t. Can't forget the last part of the quotient rule, divide everything by our original denominator squared, or v squared. That ends up looking like e to the t plus 9, all squared. And we don't almost ever expand the denominator in our quotient rule, but we do want to try to simplify the numerator if possible. So there's a bunch of different ways to simplify the numerator. Maybe one quick way, since we're low on space here, is to recognize, well, there's this common factor of 100 times e to the t. If we pull that common factor out, what is left over? Well, just all the other quantities, e to the t plus 9 minus e to the t. So skipping a couple of steps, we can cancel that e to the t part out. And what we're really going to be left with then is just 900 e to the t. So our numerator is 900 e to the t. And we're not going to change our denominator at all. I'll just leave it in that factored form e to the t plus 9, all squared. And now this is our formula for p prime of t. So we just have to plug 4 in for t in our first derivative function, right? Just replace all these t's here with 4's. Definitely got to use a calculator or computer to uh, evaluate that. But if we do evaluate this, we get approximately 12.1. All right, so we'll talk about the units for that quantity 12.1 in a second, but that is the value of our first derivative. So now if we go back to kind of our Mad Lib or general setup for writing a sentence interpreting our derivative, we just have to now make some substitutions. So instead of saying after t, the rate at which p changes is predicted to be uh, given by p prime of x, we're going to add context to that. 
All right, so now we're just filling in these uh, blank spaces with the appropriate information and context for our function. Remember, our function P is representing the percent of the population infected by this Budweiser virus, and T is representing the number of weeks since that initial infection was discovered. So here we're interpreting P prime of four being 12.1. Well, after four weeks, the rate at which our function p, and we don't want to write the function p, we want to write what it's describing. So the rate at which the percent of the population infected by the Budweiser virus, give me a second to write all that. All right, so what we have so far after four weeks, the rate at which the percent of the population infected changes is going to be predicted to be that value of 12.1, right, the value of our first derivative. And what are the units of this rate of change? Well, it's just the units of the function divided by the units of the input. Our function's units is the percent of the population. And the units of the input, T in this case is, well, number of weeks. So filling in all that relevant, relevant information, we have our short sentence interpreting the first derivative of this function at four. So P prime of four being 12.1 tells us in this situation that after four weeks have occurred, um, the rate at which the percent of the population of people infected by this virus is actually going to be increasing by 12.1% per week, right? We know it's increasing because it is positive. If our derivative ended up being negative, that's telling us the, the percent of the population infected, the rate of change of that is actually decreasing. So that tells us if our uh, rate of change here was going to be constant for that entire week, which it will actually change throughout the week, but if we assumed it was constant, then we know that after four weeks, about 85.8% .8 of the population would be infected. If we were to let uh, time go on for one additional week, then that would be predicted to increase according to our rate by an additional 12.1%, putting us up to like 97.9%.